Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this slightly brisk afternoon, uh, different than the last few days. My name is Peter Bachland. I'm the Associate Director of the School of Global Environmental Sustainability here at CSCU. And uh, this is uh, this event is part of our kind of what I would describe as our return to our attempted return to normalcy and having in-person events. So we haven't had very many yet, but we've been easing into it this spring. We're very excited that you all have uh, chosen to join us for what I think is going to be a really interesting set of presentations and discussion. So we're joined today by uh, Jim Hurl, who is a Scott Presidential Chair in Engineering, professor here in CSU, and uh, Ken Shockley, who is a, the Holmes Ralston Chair in Environmental Ethics. I promised them I wasn't going to try and go through all that. I can kind of remember their, their prestigious appointments, and they are uh, some of our really great scholars here at CSU, and we're very pleased that they uh, were willing to come and, and discuss this topic with us. And so you can see the title of Jim's talk up here, Climate Intervention to Cool a Warming Planet. Uh, as we were preparing for this, I often thought back to a remark that I've heard former presidential science advisor John Holder make several times when talking about climate change, where he framed it as a problem where, where our choices were essentially to, to mitigate, i.e. reduce emissions, to adapt, change human practices and, and policies and things like that to help reduce impacts or suffer. So he said there was really only three choices, mitigation, adaptation, or suffering. And today we're actually talking about a potential fourth choice, which is additional intervention to change the air system to limit the impacts of climate change. And so it's, it's related to both mitigation and adaptation, but it's slightly different and there's a whole host of issues surrounding this topic and whether or not uh, research and more significantly implementation of this you know, should happen. But as, uh, as we all see, those of you who follow the climate change debates and the climate change policy process internationally, the essential uh, re reality of the situation is that nations get together and negotiate and make uh, ambitious promises and set ambitious goals for action in the future, almost none of which are actually realized. And so I've been working on climate change for you know about 30 years now. And when I started, we were having these arguments and we've now uh, you know put more CO2 into the air since I started working on this issue than we had in the entirety of human history up till that point. Emissions aren't slowing down. There are limited successes in various countries at decoupling emissions from economic growth, so you can say there's some glimmering signs of hope out there, but the overall picture is that emissions and concentrations continue to rise, temperatures continue to rise, and as the impacts become increasingly severe and noticeable, people are really wondering, what are we going to do about the problem? And um, this is a very interesting window into one set of activities that we might undertake to deal with the problem. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jim first. He'll be followed by Ken. I think uh, I'll leave it up to you guys whether you want to take questions during your presentations or if you'd like us to hold all the questions to the end. But the hope is that Jim will kind of present some information to us and Ken will present and comment a little bit on what Jim said and then we're hoping for a really robust discussion. So I strongly encourage Q&A, I think there's a lot to talk about with this issue and we'll learn a lot from both presentations. And so with that, Jim, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. And yeah, I'll just say feel free, especially like a clarifying question if I make a, a comment or something that, that's confusing, uh, please speak up and I'd be happy to try to, to clarify it. So I'd like to just begin by thanking Sojus and I'd like to begin by thanking you, Peter, for organizing this panel discussion and my colleague, Ken Shockley, for joining me and talking a little bit about this topic. Peter gave a very good introduction to it. It's very much in the context of climate change, the solution to which, uh, you know, we have to do climate mitigation, we have to do things like carbon dioxide removal. But what if that's not enough? Um, what if the consequences of climate change are so severe? It's the kind of problem I believe, and many people believe, we need to know what all of our options are. Um, and 
and an emerging topic is indeed this topic. Um, solar climate intervention is sometimes referred to as solar geoengineering or uh, sunlight reflection management. It goes by numerous terms, but the whole idea is should we intentionally modify the behavior of the system, the properties of the, the coupled Earth climate system to reflect more solar radiation back out to space to intentionally cool down the planet. And if we did that, could we avoid some of the worst impacts of climate change? So um, that's what I want to try to present to you. Peter asked me to um, kind of focus on a recent National Academy of Sciences report that was issued uh, just about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, on this particular topic. So I'm going to try to kind of frame my um, brief presentation uh, on this subject around that report. I just want to start off by saying this indeed is a topic that is in the news quite a bit. Um, this is a uh, editorial piece uh, that came out by John Deutsch, who's a emeritus professor at MIT. Um, he's, uh, I think he used to be the provost at MIT. He was director of the CIA for a couple of years, uh, deputy uh, secretary for defense, and Maria Zuber. Maybe some of you know Maria. She was uh, chair of the National Science Board. She's the VPR at MIT. A uh, very, very accomplished individual. I think presently she's actually serving as a co-chair of uh, uh, an advisor to the Biden administration on science and technology. But nevertheless, they, they published uh, this editorial piece um, in January of 2021. I just picked this one out. Uh, the key thing they're emphasizing in this editorial is that indeed the time is now. The time is now to undertake research and development uh, on this issue um, to, to really inform an assessment of whether or not we could do something that in the net would be beneficial to, to the planet, beneficial to ecosystems, beneficial in terms of human health, beneficial in terms of avoiding some of the worst impacts of climate change. And they ultimately recommend, they say, we believe the United States should launch a solar radiation management research and development program now. Well, during that same time, the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. had convened a panel that was producing a consensus study report on this very topic, and I'll go through the history of this report in just a bit. And essentially, the Academy agreed, they weren't agreeing with this editorial, but simultaneously came out with a very consistent statement that indeed the U.S. should establish in coordination with other countries, so not just take it alone, but the Academy can only make recommendations to the U.S. government, so in coordination with other countries, a transdisciplinary program, so not just climate scientists like myself thinking about this, but truly transdisciplinary, a uh, solar geoengineering or climate intervention research program, and this program should focus on developing policy relevant knowledge so that we can make decisions about whether or not this was a useful tool to have in our toolbox to combat climate change rather than advancing a path for deployment. I don't know of any individuals uh, that, that I have certainly interacted with that are advocating for deploying this kind of an approach right now. This is very much about trying to study it, trying to understand what the pros and cons of solar climate intervention could be. And interestingly, um, a number of professional societies are starting to make statements along this line as well. In fact, uh, just a couple of months ago, early in February, the American Meteorological Society put out a policy statement that says that it recommends an accelerated and robust climate intervention research program and associated governance framework to inform public policies. Um, and so it's very much along the same line. You can look at other professional societies. I looked at the American Geophysical Union uh, statement on climate intervention. They too support doing research on this topic. But just to be clear, not everyone holds this viewpoint. If you go out and use your Google search engine or your preferred search engine and look for editorials on this topic, 
You will also find a number of statements by colleagues, Ray Peter Albert and Michael Mann are, are both colleagues of, of those of us that do climate research. And they have an editorial that, that states a, a completely different view. In general, their argument is one that has been prevalent in the community for a couple of decades. And that is even doing research, even conveying to policymakers especially, that maybe we could figure out some technological fix to climate change doesn't address the illness, right? To address the illness, we have to reduce emissions. We have to do carbon dioxide removal and things along those lines. This is just treating the symptoms of the illness. And it could become an excuse, they say, for fossil fuel interests and other advocates to continue business as usual. And this is generally referred to as the moral hazard argument. Maybe by even talking about doing this kind of research, it could be a deterrent toward really developing and implementing the policies we need to develop and implement in order to address climate change. Ken and I were talking just uh, earlier before this talk that you know, Working Group 3 of IPCC just released a report and you know, it talks about progress is being made, and progress is being made. And I want to thank my colleague Dave Randall for allowing me to access his New York Times subscription to download this figure. I'm not too cheap to pay for the New York Times, so when I see an article I want to read, I can go pay. And so this was a figure that appeared in an article just this last weekend. It's actually a figure from an article that appeared last year um, in the New York Times. But it was making this point. I know it might be a little bit hard to see for those of you in the back of the room, so I'll read this. But the main point of this, this is, this is uh, emissions of CO2. Um, I think this is CO2 equivalent emissions, so greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then projections of the future, right? And the point of this figure is that before the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015, the world was on a track of you know, continuing very high emissions. This is in units of hundreds of gigatons of CO2 uh, emissions per year. The world was on track of what would be very devastating warming of the planet. About four degrees, four and a half degrees of warming would be the best estimates. There's uncertainties in these numbers, but that's, that's probably a pretty good um, ballpark estimate. And, Indeed, this would widely be seen as a catastrophic kind of outcome in terms of climate change. But thanks to progress that's being made, growth in clean energy, more efficiency in buildings and things like that, not everywhere in the world, but certainly in a number of countries, current policies put us on pace for something more like three degrees of warming. So this is much better than four degrees of warming. Every tenth of a degree counts here. Right? So this is much better, but it would still lead to very significant, perhaps devastating changes in climate. Remember, we have experienced about 1.2 degrees of warming relative to 1850 conditions, so we're still talking about something three times that. Then you come to the Paris Agreement, and if the countries implement their pledges, and I want to emphasize these are pledges, these are commitments on paper, that this be optimistic and say that the world will implement the pledges. Um, perhaps we can limit the warming to something like two degrees or so by the year 2100. So this is very good, okay? The things we are doing, moving, developing toward more renewables, very, very good. I don't mean to say otherwise, but the reality is that the science says that even two degrees of warming can be very, very problematic. And this is where this one and a half degree target comes in. And there were special IPCC reports written on limiting the warming to one and a half degrees. And so much more drastic action is going to be needed. And I'll be interested to see what, what Ken has to say, but you know, it, it appears very unlikely to me that we could hit a temperature target like one and a half degrees. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but, but very unlikely. And the importance, again, for keeping the warming maybe just a few tenths of a degree higher than where we're at, and I'll go through this pretty quickly, but 
you know, I think an argument can be made that in many senses, the warming we're experiencing today is already having some very negative impacts, if not catastrophic impacts, uh, already around the world. We see this in Colorado, we see the warming in Colorado, we see snow melt earlier, we see strains on water supplies, we see extended droughts and heat waves, we see pine bark beetle, we see Courtney Schultz is here, she can talk about the wildfire season. There is no season anymore, right? It's pretty much a year-round kind of event. Um, so, catastrophic impacts right now. A lot of concern in the climate research community about these so-called tipping points. This is one example of melting of permafrost with potential massive release of carbon from, from the permafrost that would really be a very positive feedback on the warming of the climate system. We can think about ecosystems and tipping points of ecosystems. There's a lot in the literature right now about the Amazon maybe approaching the tipping point. This is an example of coral reef systems across the planet. Marine heat waves, 90% of the excess energy from climate change is absorbed in the oceans. This is leading to warmer oceanic conditions. Heat waves in the oceans having very negative impacts on coral reef systems. Of course, the melting of land ice, the melting of land ice in Greenland, in Antarctica, perhaps um, the ice shells uh, melting away and glaciers uh, falling into the ocean in Antarctica holds the potential for very, very significant and relatively rapid rises in sea level pressure, or sea level pressure, sea level rise. And if you are interested in things like climate justice, climate justice. At least in parts of the world, uh, the wealthy global north, if you will, broadly speaking, we can deal with some of these changes through climate adaptation. Climate adaptation is very critical to the climate change we've already committed to and we will continue to experience. But many of the parts of the world can't, especially the poor nations, the global south, for instance. So these are all very significant issues. I'm not going to spend much time on this diagram. This is a so-called Ember diagram from IPCC. This is a relatively old Ember diagram, but I like this better than the newer Ember diagrams. Um, but it's just basically showing that you know you can think about food, water, ecosystems, extreme weather events, or these tipping point kind of things, and the risk and the impacts become much more severe as the warming increases to the right. So again, we've had about one. 1.1, 1.2 degrees of warming uh, relative to pre-industrial times. And trying to limit that warming somewhere in this kind of range becomes critically important. So this is what brings us then to the topic of climate intervention. Again, the solution to the problem is mitigation, reducing emissions, becoming more efficient in our use of energy, um, doing things like carbon dioxide removal approaches, which I'll mention briefly. But but what else might we do? So climate intervention could be defined as the deliberate, the deliberate, intentional, large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract the impacts, at least the worst impacts, of anthropogenic climate change. So how does this fit into mitigation strategies? Well, there are risks and there are challenges to climate adaptation, as well as in limiting as I've tried to set the stage, future global mean temperature increases. So it's important to, to understand what other tools might we have in our toolbox to deal with these climate challenges. And one of these is climate intervention. Now, climate intervention is a pretty broad term. It, there's two general categories of climate intervention research. One is CDR, or carbon dioxide removal whether by accelerating natural sources of carbon dioxide removal, so we can enhance natural weathering processes of rocks as one way of removing soil carbon sequestration. We have a soil carbon solution center here at CSU, another very important activity. Reforestation and afforestation are all examples of carbon dioxide removal. In addition to technological approaches like direct air capture, and uh, long-term sequestration. So those are very critical, and those are absolutely essential to pursue in terms of meeting net zero emissions of CO2, which is something that we have to do. 
But this other approach is then solar climate intervention or solar genome engineering. The National Academy has studied this before. This is an example back in 2015. They undertook the study of climate intervention, but they actually ended up splitting CDR and solar geoengineering or solar climate intervention into two reports because they were very different kind of topics. CDR again can be defined as the removal and long-term sequestration of CO2 from the atmosphere in order to reduce global warming. This is very good. Removing CO2 from the atmosphere is the same as having never emitted it. Now there are all kinds of challenges, uh, technological challenges with scaling up and, and cost that we can talk about that. But then solar climate intervention, even though it is not a solution, the Academy in 2015 said more research is needed to understand the feasibility of this, the efficacy of the various approaches that have been uh, put out on the table, and especially the impacts. If we intentionally try to modify how the climate system is working to counteract a very bad thing, the buildup of CO2, what on earth are we doing? What are the impacts? We need to understand that. And the way that I like to think about solar climate intervention, and one of the things that I'll caution you when you read editorials that, that really kind of throw cold water on this idea, those editorials are basically saying, well, look, if we discourage mitigation, we're going to continue to emit and increase emissions into the future, and we're going to have to do more and more and more solar climate intervention to counteract that effect. I don't think that's really the most productive way to think about it. I like to think about it this way. We are going to do emission reductions. We are going to do CDR, and we are going to adapt to the extent that we can to climate change. All of these are required as part of a portfolio of options we have to implement. So we're not just going to be on the side issues curve. We are going to be cutting emissions. Hopefully we'll be able to implement. There's no one approach that's going to solve these problems. Many different uh, approaches to a carbon dioxide removal. And eventually we'll bend the curve down so that we have levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that in the long term can equilibrate and we can stop global temperatures from, from increasing. Well, what if we see this as the future, but the impacts due to the warming until we get to this point are judged to, to be too dangerous, okay? What then if we considered doing solar climate intervention for some period of time, not into perpetuity, but just for some period of time? And I think that's the way a lot of people think about this problem. So going back to the 2015 report, I'm not going to talk at all or any more in this presentation about carbon dioxide removal. If you're interested in that, there was a follow-on consensus study report published in 2019 looking at negative emission technologies and reliable sequestration and all of the challenges and potential negative impacts of some of those approaches. I'm going to focus indeed on this 2021 Academy report that really looked at solar climate intervention. There were some guiding questions given to this committee. What research is needed to assess the impacts and the risks of SCI? Again, in a very transdisciplinary approach, not just speaking to what are the changes in rainfall and temperature and winds and jet streams and things that I as a climate scientist are interested in. But what are the impacts on food production, health, solar and wind energy, ecosystems, and the like? What are the risks? Okay, And not just environmental risks, but also social and geopolitical. This topic raises a vast number of sort of ethical questions that I think Ken is going to speak to. And then if we're going to intentionally try to control the climate, if you will, we have to engage the public. Okay. And how do you do that? How do you foster meaningful public participation in the research? So these are all things that this committee was thinking about. So I put up the list of committee members, not because I expect you to um, memorize these names or even necessarily read these names. I was very honored to be part of this committee. But this was an incredibly diverse com committee. We had legal scholars. We had social scientists on this committee. We had scientists who think very deeply about governance kind of mechanisms. 
and we had physical scientists as well. So it was a really diverse group of people that the first couple of times we came together, I had no idea what the outcome of this committee report was going to be. So I think it's pretty meaningful at the end of about two years of pretty intense meetings and workshops and talking with different communities and talking to the international community that this committee did agree on this recommendation of the importance of establishing a research program. So I'm getting along in my presentation. I'm, I'm going to give you the key messages before I bore you with a few other details. So the key messages were, given the urgent growing risk of climate change, it's important to understand the feasibility, risks, and benefits of solar climate intervention as a possible tool in our toolbox. Um, because right now, we simply don't know enough about it to make any informed decisions about whether or not this would be a good idea or not. We felt as a committee it was extremely important to emphasize that climate mitigation and climate adaptation have to be done. They have to, that has to remain a central focus of our climate policies, right? Solar climate intervention is not a substitute for either. And again, we're not recommending this be deployed, but rather the research into it. So the U.S., in coordination with other countries, should establish this transdisciplinary solar research program. It should be focused on developing policy-relevant knowledge rather than advancing the path for deployment. Um, and it's really, really critical that this program uh, operate under a very robust government structure. So when I talk about solar climate intervention, just to give you a little more detail on what we're talking about, there's basically three, there's, there's multiple approaches, okay? Some people have proposed brightening the surface of the earth, literally painting roads white and rooftops white, or planting crops that have a higher albedo that reflect more solar radiation. Some people have proposed putting mirrors into outer space to reflect sunlight before it even enters in to the earth system. This study focused on three atmospheric related approaches. The first is something called stratospheric aerosol injection. This is basically mimicking the effects of explosive volcanic eruptions where tiny particles, tiny reflective particles like sulfur dioxide reside in the stratosphere and reflect solar radiation. Or we could think about brightening clouds, and we would probably try to brighten clouds that are pretty much there all of the time, such as the stratocumulus, the low cloud decks off the west coast of continents. And the third approach isn't actually, both of these would reflect some light away. The third approach doesn't actually do that. It's not strictly solar climate intervention, but it's uh, trying to, to change the, the characteristics of cirrus clouds, the fair weather, wispy clouds, relatively high up in the atmosphere. And by thinning these clouds, you would actually allow more of the long wave radiation from the planet to escape from space. Those are the three approaches. I want to just very quickly say just a little bit about each one of those. Cirrus cloud thinning, very little research actually exists on this topic, uh, is probably the least understood of these three approaches. Um, and the idea, as I said, is to, is to try to thin these clouds, extend, reduce their extent, their optical thickness, so that more of this long wave radiation can escape. The efficacy of this approach is, is simply unknown. Very challenging scientifically, a lot of scientific challenges that the Academy Report talks about. Um, and this, the, the modeling experiments on this approach that have been done to date, very few, but they kind of yield contradictory results. So a lot of fundamental climate research that I'm not going to go into needs to be done to know if this is a, a viable option. Another topic that is receiving much more attention in the climate community is this idea of marine cloud brightening. And the idea is to cool the Earth by increasing the brightness of the reflectivity of the clouds over the oceans. An analog might be ship tracks. If you're looking at a satellite photograph of the North Pacific and the ships going back and forth across the Pacific. The pollution from those ships, pollution is not a good thing, but what it does is it sort of seeds the atmosphere so that these clouds form these cloud streaks. Okay. Here the idea is we're not going to intentionally pollute the atmosphere, but we're going to add aerosols from, from seawater, at least that's what's been proposed, to produce more water droplets and brighten clouds. 
So it sounds like a pretty intriguing idea. Some of the challenges are that the details of aerosol and cloud interactions are not well understood. And so it's really unclear right now uh, where and by how much cloud albedo could be modified. And then, if we did that, what the impacts would be. And in terms of climate model studies, which is a big tool, um, Dave Randall's the climate modeling expert, one of the leading experts in the world, so he can talk more about this, put you on the spot, Dave. Um, these processes are really poorly represented in models, so it's very difficult to think about what the impacts might be. And that then brings us to the third approach, which is stratospheric aerosol injection. Again, the idea is to sort of mimic what we see uh, after explicit, explicit volcanic eruptions. This is probably the most understood and uh, most studied of these various approaches because we know it would work, or at least we have a lot of confidence that it would work because we see this in nature. The natural analog of these volcanic eruptions cool down the planet by several tenths of a degree after certain volcanic eruptions. You can see that in an observational record of temperature. So maybe we could achieve a similar effect by injecting these particles into the stratosphere, whether it be sulfur monoxide or some other particles such as uh, calcite. Again, there's major scientific questions around this. We need to understand how any impacts of this are sensitive on how much stuff we put up, what kind of stuff we put up, where we put it up, what time of the year we put it up, and these kinds of things. This is just a slide to illustrate. This is not a new topic. A very famous, uh, famous Soviet climatologist in the 1970s, Mikhail Budiko, actually proposed doing stratospheric aerosol injection in the 70s as a way to deal with what he foresaw as the growing impacts of climate change. A very famous oceanographer, Wally Grover, at the Montgomery Earth Observatory at Columbia University, revisited this idea in the 1980s. And then in the 2000s, a colleague of mine, when I was at NCAR, Tom Wingley, and then Paul Crutzen, a Nobel Peace Prize winning chemist, highly respected, and we just lost Paul about a year ago, um, also wrote an essay called The Escape Route, and basically said, look folks, we need to understand if we have a plan B. We need to understand if there's something we can do in addition to mitigation, because I'm not so sure we're going to mitigate at the scale and quickly enough to avoid some of the worst impacts. And so you can study this in climate models. This is a student uh, that I'm advising along with my colleague in atmospheric science, Libby Barnes. His name is Daniel Rubold. And he's been looking at some simulations. And I'm not going to go through the details, but this is a simulation of the warming of the planet by the middle part of this century due to emissions of greenhouse gases. And then the difference between this warming and a simulation with stratospheric aerosol injection. The way to look at this plot is basically the colors here are the reverse image of what you see at the top, basically showing that in terms of this one simple metric, and that is temperature, we think this kind of an approach could work and it could basically reverse the impacts of climate change. This is overly simplistic, it's just temperature. It's the more complicated aspects of the climate system that there are a lot of questions. So five, five more minutes, Peter? Yes? Is that saying that the cooling with this, the climate intervention would be greater in the northern hemisphere? Is that what that bottom figure is? So this is the difference between this climate change run and then this same time period mid-century with geoengineering. And so the, the cooling is roughly it's actually pretty remarkable. It's roughly, not exactly, but roughly the same magnitude as we want. Okay, so we basically reverse <coughs> for the impacts. In this one set of simulations, in this one model, all kinds of uncertainties here that we can give a scientific, a more scientific center. So wrap up in five minutes or so, is that okay, Peter? Okay, so going back to the uh, report, um, what this slide is meant to illustrate is that the Academy panel actually came up with sort of 13 different areas where a lot of research is needed. Okay, and I'm not going to go through all those 13 different areas. And then it grouped it into three major categories. The context and the goals for climate intervention research, the impacts, and the technical aspects of the feasibility of deploying something like this. And then the social dimensions. Okay, the social dimensions. Um, 
So the report really uh, talks about the importance of integrating across all of these dimensions. Sometimes in climate science, I think we feel guilty because it feels like social sciences are for a second fiddle, right? And what we were really trying to emphasize is we don't feel that way. The social questions, the social science questions are equally important here. And we wanted to really try to emphasize that. So just a quick highlight from each one of these boxes. So an integrated uh, research agenda um, is, is, is um, really focusing on what is the overall social context for doing this kind of research. And so we have these things, program development pathways, future conditions, integrated decision analysis, capacity building. Just to give you an example, so under something like program development pathways, these are the kinds of example research questions that we talk about in this report. How and by whom would decisions be made to proceed or abandon further development and deployment? What can be achieved? What's the limits to what can be achieved? And what are the fundamental trade-offs that we should be considering? When we think about the technical kind of challenges and the impacts, again, all these things, atmospheric processes, I touched on that, climate effects as well as other impacts, monitoring and attribution. Let's take monitoring and attribution. So example research questions. How do we design a monitoring system to best understand and monitor and detect the global effects of possible deployment? How can we diagnose road deployment? There are nations that are doing some of these kind of things right now. Can we detect that? Can we understand what they're trying to do? Okay. What variables give us the highest signal to noise? What variables should we be looking at to understand what the changes are? And what are the critical observation systems and the infrastructure that we need? So what I'm trying to convey is there's many, 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 this is a 300 page report, right? So there's a lot in it. And then the social dimensions. So just one example of that, public perceptions. What are effective practices for meaningful public engagement? Who are the relevant publics, and how should engagement take place? How do cultural worldviews and different attitudes toward risk affect perceptions about this? I'm not a scholar in any of these areas. I can't answer these questions. Maybe Ken can answer these questions. Okay, but the important thing is emphasizing these are equally critical aspects to be thinking about. The report also recommends the governance structure. We have to do this research in a very transparent and inclusive way. People doing this kind of research should be held to a code of conduct. There should be a registry so we see what research is taking place. Sharing of data, periodic assessments and reviews, many aspects of our research governance. Again, I'm not an expert in research governance. And so this was one of the take home figures from the report that was really trying to uh, emphasize that research activities and research governance in all of these different dimensions of this problem need to be interacting and co-evolving, evolving together. A key thing is uh, regular program review and assessment. We need to have a process in place to determine whether or not this kind of research should continue to proceed. Or maybe we should have and built into this report what are called exit ramps. How do we determine when we say, uh uh, this is not a good idea? We need to terminate this kind of research. Right? So build in exit ramps as well. And again, robust mechanisms for engaging stakeholders. Next to the last slide, I think, budget guidelines, just to emphasize that we did recommend that the US invest something like $200 million. Sounds like a big number to me, but it's not really that big of a number in the scheme of, of research. And this research should not shift resources and focus away from other important research and mitigation and things like that. Support equitably all of these research clusters, the social dimensions, the context, and the harder core physical science aspects. Um, the program budget should be dynamically allocated, so adjustments can be proceeds and again it should be accompanied by support for implementing research governance and public engagement. So in conclusion, um, climate intervention is not a substitute for climate mitigation. 
the goal is to find the right balance and interplay and understand, again, what tools we have at our disposal. Because I think the enormity of the challenges we face with climate change, we need to understand what all of the tools are that we have at our disposal. This NASA report is just talking about an initial exploratory phase of a research program, as I said, it might grow and expand, or there might be exit ramps where certain aspects of this is terminated. Um, and look at not only the technical feasibility, but also the social feasibility of doing this. And this is my final slide. So this is a colleague on the panel, Albu Shagar. Um, I really like this quote. A number of us wrote editorials, published them in the conversation uh, afterwards. And he wrote, refusing to engage on this topic also raises questions. Can we be sure that we won't need something like this in the future? And wouldn't it be better now to do the research to understand what solar climate intervention would mean? What if greenhouse warming generates horrendous climate impacts? We've been pretty good in our forecast of things, but I might argue things are happening a little faster than we might have even thought. I think IPCC tends to be conservative because it's a consensus driven process. And if it turns out that solar climate intervention is not technically feasible or socially acceptable, shouldn't we learn that now? So these are the kind of arguments for a research program. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm looking forward to your comments and happy to answer. Right here. I have a question about the ingestion model. Uh, you said they were using sulfur dioxide. Is that something that they would use in the, in the model? Yeah. Are they just mainly focusing on sulfur dioxide? There's, um, so, okay, without going into too much detail, the, so the model results, I showed the plot before, and that is being run with a, a very complete versus the model where you can actually put sulfur dioxide into the upper levels of the atmosphere and let all the chemistry happen and see how it evolves. But there's also a bunch of other experiments that have been done that have more simplified versions of climate intervention, such as even just turning down the sun to mimic effects. There are experiments now going on with uh, other chemical or you know other uh, particulars that we put in the stratosphere. So all of those ones are being done with climate models. And a very controversial aspect of this research is field experiments. And the Academy report also talked about field experiments and what the conditions might be, because some of this stuff we may not be able to fully understand unless we actually go out and do it in very limited quantities in, in ways that we Because it's one of the six criteria of climate um, clean air act and yeah. environmental health and acid rain. And putting SO2 in would increase the acidity of rainfall, yeah. but at the quantities that people propose to do, a very, very negligible effect. Thank you. Great question. Great question. Okay, so now we're going to hear from Ken Shockley uh, looking at the same issue, the same set of issues. Maybe he's been waiting for that. But from, from a you know a different perspective, and uh, let's hear from Ken, and then I'm sure we have the basis for a robust Q and A session. So yeah, thanks to Peter, thanks to Jim, thanks to Sergius. Um, so it's nice to be uh, an ethicist asked to sort of show up at these things and give a side point. But you're always like the Debbie Downer in the crowd, right? <laughs> you're always going to be the person who's like, what about? And then insert some like form of human suffering or destruction <laughs> in the background. So uh, with, that, with that said, it's also the case that I'm a philosopher, so it'll take me 20 minutes to introduce myself and I'll be done. <laughs> but um, the challenge here is to provide something like uh, an even keel discussion of this. Um, I was given the assignment to sort of go through this very specific document and lay out the ethical consideration laid within. Um, I can't help but do a little editorializing partway through, but largely what I'm doing is exegetical, bringing out the ethical context of what's happening in this document. Um, and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. So uh, I'm not trying to give a course of action or even render a verdict on this particular governance structure being advocated or the uh, practices that are being addressed there, but rather just bring out some of these ethical considerations. And I think the best way to open this, um, to put it on that keel, is to frame the question behind the report in this way. Like, under what conditions would it be acceptable to engage into research into this? 
And as long as you don't say there aren't any, like never, then it seems like there's at least a prima facie reason to think about the research program. Now that's a whole lot of caveats, um, and, but it's worth noting that what it would take to say we shouldn't even begin to engage in the research about whether we should research this. Right? That's it's a pretty far step. Now, I'll talk about the slippery slope in a minute because the slippery slope is pretty slippery, and there it is. Um, but that's at least worth starting. All right, and. There are technological and institutional hurdles that are in place for both the institutional arrangements that are governing this thing, and also um, uh, the, any sort of implementation that might be considered at whatever scale. But there are also the ethical considerations. And uh, to finish the preamble, it's worth noting that that was built into this from the outset. And if you look at other sort of uh, ethical and societal reflections on scientific processes like human subjects research, uh, the ethical considerations came in decades or centuries after the nightmares, right? And here we're anticipating the nightmares in advance, which gives us a leg up, I suppose, right? But it's also a little bit worrying. So kudos, but maybe not so much. So we'll see how it goes. So here's a couple of thoughts. So first, the, the first uh, ethical concern that's noted in the document is whether or not it's morally permissible to engage in manipulation of the climate to begin with. Now there are two ways of treating this, and to be fair, uh, especially to the ethics colleagues who are actually in the report, yeah, they slip between them a little bit, but that's the editorializing part. There are two versions, right? There's the trivial version, which shows up in some contexts, a lot of uh, newspaper editorials, for example, that we shouldn't mess with the climate at all. There's something about it that's either uh, sacred or otherwise uh, the kind of thing that when humans tinker with, whether conceptually it's a matter of humans touch something, they ruin it, or simply as a matter of practice, we find ourselves doing that. But this is hard to justify universally, because it seems like, in general, we find ourselves tinkering with things a lot, and we don't need to make it worse. And you know, if you want an example, please see your doctor. I don't think they should mess with my body, but if they can, make it, if they can undo harm done, that would be swell. So it does seem quite generally like undoing harms or compromising uh, those sorts of concerns look like a reasonable thing to do. But that, that, that said, there's a more complicated version, the less trivial version of the moral permissibility question that will show up here. And that, I'll, uh, and that I think has three factors that are kind of interwoven. The first hand, uh, on the first hand, it's what's referred to as the moral hazard argument. And I think that was David Keith that used it that way. And that was, this is the, to be fair, this is the easiest version of the moral hazard uh, argument. I'll get to a much less pleasant one later on. That hopefully, if I'm right, it'll make us all a little bit depressed. But right now, the moral hazard argument, the easier version is just, if you end up engaging in a suite of options, one of those options means that I don't have to say stop driving my car as much, I will probably take that option. In doing that, I might find a great way in which somebody else might solve my problems, right? If, if this sort of climate manipulation serves as part of a response, part of a suite of response, that takes pressure off our other mitigation strategies. After all, why stop driving when you or you know the government can uh, just adjust the atmosphere to accommodate for my current lifestyle, and so the background harmful behavior continues, or so the argument generally goes. We call this the moral hazard argument, but it's probably just uh, the beginning. Tied in the background of this is the worry about hubris, uh, the sense that it seems like uh, we have confidence when we probably ought not. Uh, we really don't know what we're doing, of course. And I know that this whole project is based on getting past the challenge of ignorance, right? Getting past the very least culpable ignorance which we're dealing with. And that's true. But if the problem isn't about knowledge, but about hubris, those are two different things, right? I mean, there's knowing, and then there's the confidence in, expl in exploiting the knowledge that one might have. And, you know, my job here is to be a little bit pushy. I was advised by Peter to be pushy, and I'd just like to say that maybe we should keep those two differences in mind. Knowing a lot and knowing how to use what we lot, well, you know how we, to use what we know. It's a significant difference to keep in mind, an ethically important one as well. I'll let you come to the examples, they're pretty pink hat. So the slippery slope argument shows up here as well. So the hubridic concern that maybe if we know things, utilizing that knowledge is a little bit different. There's the concerns that we might have uh, in virtue of compromising the mitigation, but also there's a slippery slope toward deployment. And this, I believe, is in the background of about 99% of the people who are worried about this kind of research program. Warranted or not, doesn't matter what I think, this is just the case. That in the background, uh, people are worried that if we just start talking and researching this, we're just going to start doing it. 
And that's why this fits into the suite of concerns about the mitigation strategies, because if you start researching it, that what had become unthinkable starts to become just part of a set of probabilities, right? Something you might work with. What becomes beyond the pale becomes just <coughs> part of the pale in a weird way. So uh, there's this clear fear that once we start researching and normalizing the idea of practices of climate interventions, um, the idea of deploying these technologies no longer becomes so worrying. And this particular tool is worth thinking about here. The particular strategy, especially of SAI, um, this scope is global. It's not reversible in any clear way. And this is something that I'll actually address to you uh, a little briefly <coughs> here. Like it's supposed to, it looks like it has to be a bridge technology, right? The way in which a graph worked, it looked like SAI is supposed to help us get past this bridge and drop emissions down. But there's termination shock issues. Worry about the bounce back, and, and so the worry that we might have of utilizing SAI technique technologies um, is that the reversibility conditions and how we might undo the beginning, of, uh, undo what we have begun, will be challenging from an ethical consideration. Now, again, it's not saying you're not going to do it because we'll get to the countervailing conditions in a minute. But these are at least things that should worry us in our more sober moments. Now, um, this gives us uh, the longer uh, the longer version of what's morally permissible. Uh, that in terms of manipulating the climate, we need to worry, worry not merely about tinkering with the thing, but what it is to stop tinkering it, and of course, why we're tinkering with it. And that gives rise to uh, moral permissibility concerns. And again, these are just straight out of that document. Yeah, this. Okay. The next sort of a transitional concern you might have that shows up in the document is this idea of determining the goals of geoengineering, and with that comes the question of control. Now, this is a more conceptual one, and so I find it kind of tantalizing in my philosophical uh, self. However, uh, it is also worrying in a certain way, because it gives rise to the nature of what the geoengineering prospects, especially something like SAI, would be. For, after all, you set what, what grounds are we setting it to? 1850, I don't know, 1970, 2000 BC. Well, I mean, really, the, side, the, the idea of where we're setting the, the background conditions is something not determined by any specific signs. It's going to be determined as a judgment call by what we think is the appropriate ground to set it to. Now, maybe that's limited by technology. Maybe it's limited by other matters of science. But it's worth thinking about what we're setting it to and why. Once that question opens up, then we get to this position of why not just make things a little bit more pleasant? Why not take it with the climate so that, I mean, I came here six years ago with the express purpose of looking at the difference between, uh, looking at the intersection, hopefully not the difference, between climate change sustainable development practices and environmental protection. And I'm thinking about sustainable development here, about the global south. Because man, if you could tinker with a little bit of the climate, some sort of confidence, you could make the world a better place. And in fact, wouldn't it be morally problematic not to? Once you get started, why would you do it to 1850 and not just make the world a better place? Now that should give everyone the heebie-jeebies, just maybe a little bit, right? And so this is the, the worrying shift. When we start asking these questions and going down this road, what are we researching exactly? How we might do it, but what are we setting the, setting the baseline conditions to? And of course, um, this is the sort of opening ethics question in many cases, the who question. Who gets to decide how to set the global thermostat? Right? The people who are affected by it? Surely not the people who would still end up at the back end of the global south political dynamic. Right? So where do we set that global thermostat? Given the differential effects of climate change, both through current patterns of change and motive, those motivated by um, was aggravated by geoengineering. The power relations will be extraordinarily important and worth worrying about. And again, to be fair, this is all covered to some extent in this document. So this isn't straightforwardly like an outside critique. This is built into that document. But I think, as I was mandated, it's worth emphasizing that these are real and serious concerns that need to be brought up in the context of geoengineering generally, and especially in the context of probably the most risky version of geoengineering, SAI, the stratospheric aerosol injections. Okay, now once you get the who question in, that opens up the questions of justice and equity concerns quite, quite rapidly. For climate change, this is a, a whole field of climate justice is tied up with looking at the differential effects, both about at a time and across time, which lead to two serious questions about a balance of the burdens and benefits associated with our changing climate. In the particular case of geoengineering, these concerns um, are aggravated substantially. And again, this goes back to the question that I find tantalizing, which is why it shows up here again. Why shouldn't we just then engineer the climate to a more appealing climate, a friendlier one, sort of more Eden-esque? 
Now, uh, once we have the differential concerns of climate justice showing up, that's one set of concerns. But then there's also this set of concerns that's going to show up in future generations. And a lot of ink has been properly spilled here. For if there are worries about loss of voice and disempowerment by current generations, future generations just have that, right? It's not just a matter of practice or politics, or economics or power. It's a matter of ontology. Their voice is simply impossible to be present, and so representing their interests are deeply problematic. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I got on a burn there and lost track of where it was. <laughs> All right. For these folks are most vulnerable to our decisions on and actions or, or failures to act, and it's remarkably difficult to provide the sort of voice necessary for equity in the resolution of those justice concerns. So it's often, in the words of Stephen Gardner, just too convenient to worry about the now and not about the then. Gardner refers to um, this in a tellingly clear turn of phrase, intergenerational thought passing. It's really easy to try to worry about problems now and think of any consequences or um, adverse effects of that as something that the smarter people in the future will be able to deal with. Uh, to quote a different movie, how's that working for you so far? <laughs> so there's a worry in the background that we'll end up um, locking in those future generations at the cost of massive rebound effects. This is the termination shock concern, sort of indefinitely. Now, again, there could be countervailing considerations. Absolutely, right? But this is just something that we have to build into the deliberation process and make sure that we're not eliding over this and our enthusiasm for a response that doesn't require us to stop driving cars. So the response that's built in again to this program goes something like this. The recommended program is clearly cognizant of these ethical concerns. It's built into it. It's baked into it. And again, especially thinking about the history of human subjects research as a parallel case, awesome. Just fantastic. So much ahead of the curve, which is good because it's not like the human subjects case where you have these compromising cases and people die and suffer, but the world carries on. In this case, well, the subjects of the world, so that's a little harder. Now, it's fair that doing nothing has clear moral challenges. Sorry, that's clearly grammatically horrendous. Um, there are clear, uh, clear uh, moral challenges that are tied up to not doing anything. And failing to develop this program puts at risk of having no option at all, uh, which again looks like we've tied our own hands in the face of the prospect of doing something that might make people's lives better or uh, affect justice in a positive way. The failure to act has consequences as well. And so the question is how we balance those in a meaningful way. There are a range of other ethical considerations that show up in here, and I'm aligning over a lot of them. There are questions of agency who's involved and how they're affected by these actions. There are questions of the other than human world, which are built into certain features of this in a remarkable way. The, um, the document is built on the, I'm trying to see if I'm getting a signal from, uh, from Peter here, because I've already gone over. But, uh, but I'll just not look at them. So the, uh, um, so if you look at the way in which the publics are addressed, the publics are supposed to be addressed in this document, it's the thought that there are um, broad, what's the turn of phrase, Jim? Uh, there's these, uh, the three publics that are referenced, uh, current, broad, and oh, current intergenerational and ecological publics are supposed to be the, uh, the focal point of all the governance mechanisms. And so uh, characterizing what an intergenerational public is challenging, an intergenerational ecological public is even more challenging. But the idea that that's built and baked into the system of governance is supposed to be a way of addressing some of these considerations. Um, whether it's through the research oversight project, which is part of the part of the way in which those ethical concerns are addressed in the document, or also just the administrative safeguards that are sort of built into the project. In doing this, uh, the hope is that you get a framework that can be used to investigate, analyze, uh, and hopefully provide, pro provide protection against wayward users of technology and a range of other considerations. All right. It's a rosier picture. So here's some concluding thoughts. There are a bunch of worries um, that might show up here, even after going through the report. The irreversibility and scale of this whole project is something that we should all pause in. I mean, this is would be like the largest scientific and technological interventionist enterprise engaged in by the species. Just pause for a second. Holy cow, right? It's spectacular in this year at least. If that doesn't make us pause, then we should wonder why, because that's probably going to go back to the hubris word like nine slides ago, right? Um, and we have someone, uh, we have a history of failing to engage in the kind of governance that makes this seem less ethically problematic. Those concerns should worry us to some extent. 
And there were concerns over different impressions of the imposition will harm. Um, this is, um, my notes on this are long. The basic worry is that we have a really deep affection toward people who are near us and near us, and people who are near us, and a harder time recognizing the ethical significance of our actions on people far away, whether in space or time, or whether they're not human persons at all. And those kind of contrasts shape the way in which our decisions get made. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to stop worrying. That's not a block for anything. But it certainly should give us pause about how we go about making our decisions. Um, that's tied to crisis deliberation. Uh, the idea that we need to act now because we're about to all you know, in a sort of catastrophe, right? Well, that leads us to make all sorts of terrible decisions. and leads to what I take to be the deeper worry, at least the one that keeps me up latest at night. And that's, the, well, I think, the harder version of moral hazard. We can make a lot of decisions about uh, individual action and public policy in the climate context. Some of those will look innocuous, like uh, energy profiles and whatnot. But they have this other risk of putting future generations in the condition where those future generations cannot make an ethically acceptable choice. That, to me, seems like, for me, that's the hard problem of climate ethics. There are a lot of hard problems, but this is the hardest one to me. That you end up engaging not just in decision making that's ethically fraught, but decision making that seems not so problematic. But the effects of those decisions put future persons, real persons, who just have the disadvantage of not yet existing, in conditions where they cannot make a choice that doesn't end up compromising something that's morally uncompromisable. That's terrible. And so, for me at least, the ethical framework has to have the kind of risk profile that accepts that kind of morally problematic condition as one that should frame our decision making. That's hard. <coughs> so then the challenging question in the specific context that I was recommended to uh, address, does SAI uh, make this concern more or less likely to arise? Is it the kind of thing, even if it changes the decision space of future generations, because they have to engage in continued acts of SAI in the future, does it reduce the prospect that our other decisions will put them in morally compromised positions? Or does it make it better? For me, that's one way of framing it long term, it sort of puts intention to this. I don't have a great answer to this. I wish I did. I, I want to have an answer to this. I don't. Right? But for me, at least, that's the morally painful question here. So uh, to close, to go over and close, um, I should just say that, again, this is the caveat at the end of the ethics thing. I'm here not to point fingers or make judgments. I'm here simply to sort of point out the range of concerns that we would be remorseful not to consider when we try to deal with something as monumental, something that the species has never, never done before, right, in these contexts. That simply asking the questions of science, with all due respect, are not going to get us the right answers that we need to make these, take these questions seriously as moral beings. And personally, I understand the drive for this program, and that the idea of, of ignorance here could easily, and is almost certainly culpable ignorance. It's not knowing the thing that would help us to resolve a moral problem is a big deal. But I'm uneasy, and I think that uneasiness is the right response. I think we should have a lot of moral residue here, right? Uh, it should make us feel fun. So, and I was reminded when I was going through this, and my, my wife thought this was funny, so I kept it in. Uh, so Isaac Asimov has a line that says, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. When I was a younger person, a friend responded cynically, but it might be much higher on your list of action items if you're very competent at it. And I think that's actually the worry behind a lot of this, the fear, right? That, that in accepting the implicit understanding of the program that we're not going to solve it through policy, that we're not going to fix these things, that we might find ourselves being competent at something that maybe it's not awesome to be competent at. I mean, there's a lot built into this program. The toll, what's called the toll gate principles that I cut out, the ethical guidelines I cut out, all the things I cut out. The, there's practical oversight that's all over the place, and it's all good. But in a context where you've demonstrated a remarkable lack of constraint politically, economically, and socially, it would be a moral failing itself not to be concerned that this program might be one more road paved with good intentions that leads to somewhere very hot. Thanks. Wow, let's join me in thanking both of you. And the hope now is that you have some great questions. I know that I have some, but I'm going to restrain myself in the question space for those of you who fill. Yeah. Uh, please identify yourself and then ask a question. Yeah, uh, Phil Gaffaro, professor in the philosophy department. Uh, and this is a question for, for both of you. Um, 
it seems clear to me that SAI is, is the latest alternative to actually facing the causes of climate change, which seems to be too many people and too large an economy for the earth. So, you know, we, we're always looking for technological fixes to that. Um, so I, I, my specific question for you is this. If you take this out of the context of trying to find a solution to climate change and instead look more broadly at human impacts on the planet, uh, maybe the, the planetary boundaries approach, um, are, are you still going to be as uh, amenable to doing SAI? If, if you sort of recall that a growing population and a growing economy aren't just causing climate change, but they're acidifying the ocean, they're, uh, we've got potential issues with novel, uh, novel organisms, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that sort of undermine the case for SAI or, or not? Or are you still sort of just as enthusiastic as a, with it, uh, as a potential? Let me first say that calling me enthusiastic about SAI misses a bit. 90%. No, I know, I know. You you were not as enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, just, I just want to go down. Put my cards down a little bit. Well, on, on the comment of enthusiasm, I, I too would say, you know, if you come away with an impression that I or my colleagues that think about this as being enthusiastic, I would actually say a lot of the motivation for doing this, in my personal opinion, and what drove a lot of the committee discussions, because we spent a lot of time gathering data and talking to various people was the very real prospect that people are going to try to do some of these things. And there are examples of this already out there where people are trying to modify the climate for good purposes, right? In Australia right now, grave concern about losing the Great Barrier Reef. So they're doing climate intervention. They're trying to brighten clouds. They are trying to make the, the ocean surface more reflective. They are pumping up colder waters with depth without really understanding. That all sounds great. What can we do to save the Great Barrier Reef? But what are the other consequences of doing that? So I think the very real possibility of unilateral action without really understanding, okay, what all the consequences, not only physical consequences, but moral, ethical, et cetera, are, is something that we have to be aware of with our eyes wide open. So I would say a motivation for proposing a research program with all these different dimensions, not just on the physical science side, but the kind of issues that Ken highlights, was done in the context of not enthusiasm, or not saying, hey, this really could be a great solution that we have to do, but the reality that, that, that the likelihood of people beginning to do these things is increasing, especially as they experience some of the impacts of climate change. Well, so right, just, could, we, we often, in those situations, say uh, these things are, are too dangerous to do. And, you know, that's, of course, another alternative. But I want to ask a follow-up question. That, I mean, how many examples of the global community not being able to solve these kind of huge collective action problems? And how many examples of human societies not being able to intelligently deploy technologies for various purposes would it take for, for you to lose faith in this kind of effort? I mean, I was listening to some of the wonderful guardrails the committee was putting up there. You know, listening to the public, for instance, and, and having been involved with, you know, EISs for specific projects in the United States and understanding a little of how difficult it is to set up that process and, and actually do justice to people's concerns. And, you know, we're going to do that at the global scale, right? I mean, it's just farcical. It, it's ridiculous to suggest that. I mean, if we ever do SAI, it's going to be a few very powerful people putting it over and, and seeing what happens. You're not going to have public input. It's, it's okay, so Phil, that goes more into comment than question, and I, I think it's a very valid comment for us all to think about, but I want to give other people a chance to ask questions. Well, take that as a question. I mean, is there any limit to our optimism for our ability to organize the world? No, I, well, I, first of all, I 
I agree with your overall point that you know I think there's many examples of where it has been challenging to come together. There are success stories of some sort of environmental challenges, things like ozone depletion and things like that, but that didn't really involve the kind of the scale of public engagement that we're talking about with this kind of a program, right, in, in, in my view on that. So I, I completely understand your causes for pessimism, dare I say, about how something like this could work. But again, I think what the, what the National Academy uh, Committee was really wrestling with was that um, if this kind of research is going to proceed, and I just want to caution everyone right now, this is proposing that the U.S. engage in this kind of a transdisciplinary research program. It really doesn't exist that much. There are limited investments in very narrow aspects of, of thinking about this at this point. What the committee was really trying to say was that if we do this, things like public engagement and the huge immense challenges that you're raising around doing that the right way really do need to be addressed. Okay? Maybe you're right. Maybe it's it's uh, impossible to do. I don't know. I haven't engaged in that kind of research, but I do recognize that you know engaging in that dialogue um, is something that we have to aim for if we're going to try to do this kind of a research program at all. I think that condition is part of what's happening. This isn't a political I meeting. Whether or not this is how it's being understood on the ground or by all the actors, one might also put it this way: uh, if this is, if there is going to be. Um, actionable research on SAI, here are the conditions under which it would have to, would have to be satisfied for it to be morally acceptable or politically expedient, which are the terms in here, right? And one would hope that you could easily notice tolls then, right? And be like, well, we could never do that, so we shouldn't try to do this, right? That would be the parallel case for human substance research. However, you know, will people actually do that? Well, that's a different question. Yes. Uh, Jacob Andrews, first year graduate student, Dr. Thomas Borch Lab. I'm kind of curious on what research they're proposing to do. Uh, is it mostly just developing more accurate models? Is there any way you can kind of test this experimentally just from like a research approach? Yeah, so that's a really good question. The, the committee spent a lot of time really considering, and I had a slide, I didn't show the slide. There's a whole section of the report on what we call outdoor experimentation. Yeah. The recommendations of the committee is that um, in this, in this broad topic of solar climate intervention research and introducing particles, aerosols to the atmosphere, whether it be marine cloud brightening or stratospheric aerosol injection, everything that we can learn about the topic from laboratory-based studies or from model-based studies is what we need to exploit. If there are certain aspects of it, and you can talk to people who say, absolutely, we're going to have to do some experimentation but if outdoor experiments are required to, to understand um, you know the, the impact of a certain type of aerosol that we might introduce into the aerosol those have to be done under very very stringent conditions and the report outlines in our estimation what those conditions might be thank you let's come over here next um, hi Kim currently a PhD student in the School of Environmental Engineering, but transferring probably to political science this fall. Um, I have a question a little bit about, um, this is a little bit of a state of the science in terms of um, our ability to understand climate impacts on smaller, more regional scales. So my understanding is that there's enough chaos in the climate system that that's still pretty hard. Um, so even just from a climate adaptation standpoint, we're, we're having a hard time being able to plan well. So how, like how in parallel do you think our advancement and understanding in that space could be with understanding the implications of this intervention? Because where my mind went first is like, well, who's going to feel what impacts where, and how is that going to affect our understanding of food, energy, water system management? Um, and then I just am gonna tag on a comment that like, we'd be in a lot better place if we had been talking about having these types of conversations about extracting and burning all the fossil fuels, <laughs> you know, way back when. Um, I wish we had done that. Yep. But. Very true, yeah, good question, you want me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, you know, there's there's multiple ways to think about this, and, and you know, I think it's a, a good topic for a much more detailed conversation. There are definitely, when we think about climate models and climate models as tools, there are some things that they can do very well. And if you think about projections of how climate change is going to unfold, and you go back and you look at the history of running these kind of models, developing these models, improving these models, um, we've been able to um, predict, if you will, I would stand up and, and, and argue quite a few things with quite a bit of good accuracy, right, in terms of looking at the large scale projected changes in climate that are going to occur. And these are the same kind of models that we can use to understand things like the potential impacts of stratospheric aerosol injection. That being said, you were talking about very fine, very fine scale kind of processes and really being able to resolve things. You know, climate model development continues. I mentioned, I don't know if you want to speak up, Dave, but Dave is leading a project here to develop what we call a global storm resolving version of the model. So how can we begin to run these very complex Earth system models at the kind of spatial scales that you're talking about, where we're resolving things not on grid scales of tens or even hundreds of kilometers, but on grid scales of a kilometer kind of resolution. So that kind of progress is being made. That's the future of climate modeling. And these same kind of problems, you know, thinking about the impacts of climate intervention can utilize those same kind of model developments. Right now we have the ability to, you know, kind of zoom in on specific regions, but we know the global climate system is fully interconnected. So what Dave's driving at, how can we run these models efficiently at that very high spatial resolution, I think is where we're going to be um, over the next decade. Do you want to add to that, Dave? Just quickly. Uh, a very high resolution isn't going to solve all the problems, but it will help. Right. It will help. That's right. You got a question over here, sir? Yes. Um, Patrick Shaver, I'm a geography professor at Front Range Community College. Uh, my question actually has to do with the role of private industry in all this. So was that something the committee took into consideration? You know, you know, you mentioned ozone and the you know, Montreal Protocol, and that was partially successful because there was other products that could replace that. I can't help but imagine that this kind of research would eventually lead to private industry that would essentially be implementing it, that, that, it, that eventually somebody's going to want to make money off of it. So I was wondering if that was a consideration at all in, in, in your work, and then from an ethical perspective. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. so. It's profoundly, and it's in the document, uh, it shows up there as a guardrail, as a, as a guardrail guideline. Um, it's hard to know how to make a, a formal block on such a thing in a document that seems to be so idealized politically. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's acknowledged in there. What else to say at that point? Yeah, so it was a consideration. Um, I think that you're right. I mean, and right now there are private companies that are interested in exactly this kind of research. And I'm not going to sit here and try to. Uh, Articulate why they might be interested in this kind. There's probably both good reasons and negative reasons, but I think the private sector is keeping an eye on this. To the middle and then to the That's Nathan buying this. Yeah. Nathan Mueller, uh, ESS and Southern Crop. And I know from a food production point of view, one of the concerns with stratospheric aerosol injection is the solar dimming and that that could decrease crop productivity at the same time maybe the cooling is helping the crop productivity. So my question is, with some of these other uh, techniques for solar geoengineering, like focusing on marine clouds, is that less problematic? Because I also heard you say that still involves you know, aerosols of some, some kind. And is that more localized? Does that help alleviate some of those concerns? much discussion around that. Yeah, so, I mean, you're exactly right. Well, you know, one of the things about stratospheric aerosol injection is we know it could, it could be done quickly with immediate impacts 
and we also know that the sky would become more opaque. And so there's not only those concerns about how it might impact agricultural, agricultural productivity, very real concerns, but things like uh, solar energy, right? If you're running a solar energy plant, you don't want the, the, the sky, you know, the light to become more diffuse and things like that. Um, when it comes to marine cloud brightening, you know, the one little shy slide that I put up, um, there's so much that's really unknown about, you know, what the impact of that would have. There, the aerosols are much more localized. It would just be in these specific kind of oceanic regions. But if you kind of think about that from, from the enormity of, of the challenge we're facing, if we really, you know, like Ken was saying, why not make the climate a better place? You know, why, why stop at 1850 temperatures or something like that? It's hard for me to really picture, I'm, I'm in favor of doing the MCB kind of research, but it's hard for me to see how that's really going to scale up, to have the kind of impact on a global scale that, that maybe a program like this would ultimately be driving toward. Um, but I don't think, it's a very different thing, you're not injecting aerosol that's going to spread globally, it's going to be very localized at very low levels, it's going to brighten the clouds, but probably not do much else beyond. Two questions. I'll leave it to you, Peter, whether to allow it. Two, two is fine. Um, Courtney Schultz, a professor at Forest Policy, Natural Resource Policy. Um, Jim, my quick question is, what can we expect in terms of a decision on the recommendations that the group's making? Like, who's going to make the decision and when do you expect it? Yeah, so another slide that I, that, I, that I took out, although I saw there was one sentence in there. So the committee recommended that the U.S. Global Change Research Program kind of take ownership of this. And there's 13 major agencies that participate in USGCRP. Um, so all I know right now is that this committee set of recommendations is still being discussed by that. I also happen to know, though, that the, the uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, has been mandated by Congress to provide a five-year roadmap for what a research program in this area would look like. And they are actively working on that right now. So from kind of a formal, like a national program in this area, all I can tell you is it's a, it's a topic of discussion with OSTP and with, with the federal agencies. I can furthermore add, though, that parts of this research are starting to be funded. NOAA has a program called the Earth Radiation Budget Program that specifically, and again, in, in response to a congressional mandate, is providing some money now to the research community to kind of look at the, the aerosol aspects, cloud aerosol, microphysical aspects of these kind of problems. Um, DOE is providing some funding along these lines, so it's beginning to come into play. But the question that you asked, when will we see this? I can't answer definitively other than I think, I do think the nation is going to implement some sort of a research program in this direction, whether or not they're going to adopt all of the committee recommendations, I just can't say. Yes. I've been part of uh, National Academy panels where 10 years later go, well, that had no impact, <laughs> right? And then I've been part of other panels where it's like it really did lead to some change. Thanks, Jim. And Ken, my other question was for you. I've just been chewing on your last slide, and you were talking about not wanting, or potentially this intervention making like an impossible choice for future generations between two very evil choices, I think. And I'm just curious, like, how do you think about that in a case like this where the status quo is also the result of a bunch of human choices that are creating like really difficult decisions now that are compromising livelihoods. Like, how, how do we think about the status quo versus intervention and like the ethics of that? I, I think I'm, am I making sense? Yep, yep. And sadly, my last slide actually was all these pictures of hope, but I cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for that, Ken. No problem. Just you. Yeah, leave it on not being sad, and I just forgot it. Um, yeah, so the, the challenge we're all having, of course, is that it iterates. Uh, so either you address it now, or it gets worse at next iteration. So uh, there's a sense of urgency tied up with it. Now this is just a framework for response, and I can't say you know, what we ought to do exactly, especially in this case. But yeah, we're already in a position where the choices we make now uh, will probably have untoward consequences immediately and in the future. The challenge is that if we don't make those choices, or if we make the wrong ones, 
the next generation, and that generation could be like a year from now, not 20, will have, a, have an even worse set of scenarios to engage in. So, I mean, this is just a long-winded way of what my grandfather would say, suck it up, buttercup, and do what you're supposed to do, right? I mean, this is supposed to be a drive toward making us engage in mitigation strategies now. And I, I pulled that slide out, uh, which was just, you know, what this is really drive us toward. If you look at the consequences and the concerns over SAI, as again, one of the most challenging uh, by, uh, solar engineering, solar engineering uh, efforts, um, the response to this would be shit like, oh my god, do everything else now. And I don't know if I'm answering your question or just getting on a pedestal, but I think a lot of it is really just, this should be a wake up call that if we're down to like this being a viable option from a political standpoint, we're already in the position where we're taking horrible choices and trying to figure out whether we're going to make them more horrible or not. And again, this is Thanks. Sir, thank you. The opponents of topology and geography. Um, Thank you for your presentations. Um, my concern is, I think a concern that is reflected in the global south that was mentioned, right? And it's this little agency, agency if any, yeah. uh, regarding this topic, right? Not in the problem at the beginning, not in the potential solution. Uh, so I wanted to ask if, you know, indigenous people have been asked about this, if other groups like myself and Guatemalan have been asked about this since we are suffering most of the consequences of this. So that's my first question and the follow-up. If it works, if it shows that you know we can reduce the um, radiance back to the Earth and then uh, or, or increase the reflectance, then it might have a perverse incentive that will polarize people and saying, "Well, we have a solution, and you're against it," which might be detrimental. M mitigation here, as you know, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere has been just placed as one option that has this one impact. But it has many options on biodiversity, on hydrological cycle regulation. Where are those other parallel? incentives for current uh, mitigation strategies that we know that work but have not been in place to do policy. It's not that they're failing themselves in science. We know how trees capture CO2 and how much they do. It's in policy. So my, my fear is in the future something as useful as this could actually work, be promoted by, because I saw your slide mentioning um, property, intellectual property, that at size a red flag for me saying, oh, this is going to sell, right? Someone's going to make money out of this and then it's out of our control and then become a perverse incentive and polarize those that oppose it for, for many reasons, right? Or have doubts, reasonable doubts behind it for many reasons. And then if you're not without or against this, right? Um, how do you go around those challenges of inclusiveness already in this community that you're part of? Um, should, should inclusiveness start at there? Was it, in, was it inclusive or was it a strictly Western science vision? Sorry, sorry if it's many questions. <laughs> That was a great question. Before I let you guys answer, I do want to defend both my panelists and say that they both actually raised a similar issue to that in our discussions planning the event and suggested the need for including perspectives from the Global South in the discussion very strongly. As the organizers, I take full responsibility for not managing who's organized enough to have a representative speaker on that. Okay, so but I think that we have, I think many of the, those of us who planned the event are cognizant of the issue you raised. I'm very glad you asked this question. I want to let them respond substantively to that. Yeah, so I think Ken and I are brainstorming this 530. Just a very quick, but I'm happy to talk to you further. An absolutely critical point that you raise here, right? So this committee for this particular academy study, which was a US National Academy study, recognized this. We tried to build in a lot of language about really the importance of having this be international and having the Global South represented. I will just tell you that another activity that I'm engaged in, the World Climate Research Program, has recognized in the context of solar climate intervention the importance of this. There's a project sponsored by the World Climate Research Program called Decimals, where funding is specifically going to scientists in Global South countries to look at this. And so those scientists are engaging right now some of like the model simulations that I'm talking about, to look at what the impacts or project out to the best of our ability, given limited tools and perfect models and things like that, what the impacts might be on ecosystems or on just the climate in, in their countries, um, because they are suffering a lot of the kind. And then there was a session at the, uh, at the uh, getting tired, the um, um, COP meeting, Conference of the Parties, 
Scotland last fall, right? There was a special session on this topic involving scientists from the Global South about you know their views on it. Do they want to you know do they favor a research program on it and whatnot? It was a fascinating discussion. The majority said they do. That they they want to understand whether or not this is something that can help alleviate some of the suffering right now from climate change. But it's a really really important question. And we should worry about it. This is like the question of voice that shows up in all of these policies is you end up having empowered and well-financed organizations, whether they're economically structured or just politically powerful, they end up having all the voice. In the background of uh, this document, though, to be fair, it's um, there are a couple of, uh, Kyle White has been centrally figured in, in this document. This, I don't know how many times he's cited in here. And um, he's sort of a, I don't know, a, a prominent voice. He's tied up in the President's and, uh, Environmental Justice Commission and has been tied up in trying to get that problem recognized uh, as more than an afterthought. Uh, and this is just me nodding along with you mostly. Yeah, that's a big problem. It's not recognized enough and it has to be acknowledged more. Um, and more than acknowledged, I mean, like at the cop parties when I've been there, like there, there's always sort of a central a central focus on Global South voices. But then when you get through the actual determinations and the judgments that come through those documents, it's, uh, there's the word, there's a whole lot of lip service going on. And yeah, I mean, I think it would, we would, again, be engaged in moral dereliction of duty to not be worried about that in the development of a program of this kind of scope and endurance. So, yes. All right, we're going to squeeze in one final question. We're very much at the end of our time here. You know, I don't see anybody twitching too drastically. So we're going to have one final question. Yeah, I just back. want to follow on, Jim, on an earlier comment you made about the OSTP and get a five-year roadmap. Is the EU doing something similar or other nations doing something similar to that? So that there may be this, I'm hoping you're going to say yes, unifying consensus around scientists and some policies. There are similar discussions and activities and proposals of coordinated research programs in, across the EU right now. So yes, my short answer is yes. Thank you. But again, United States and the EU. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So please join me in thanking our panelists.